sitting, uh, standing up here looking at the stuff that Chuck has put on, and I, he looks, you know, very interesting. He's got a lot to talk about. We, um, I met Chuck for the first time this summer after I had contacted him about um, coming and speaking on the conference, and it was just really, really great to meet him after all these years of um, knowing that he's written a book that I think has been, you know, essential for a lot of people in coming out of the church, and and um, was very anxious to have him come and speak to us. I, he spoke to us when we were just kind of a fledgling organization and we're having the, the uh, conferences, and I believe it was Vegas that you spoke, right? I think it was the first or second year we got together. So people have been bugging me all these years since to get you on the, on the agenda again. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Charles Larson. to be here this time last year. <laughs> you know, sitting here last night listening to the testimonies of so many of you was so familiar because every different experience is so similar, isn't it? The things that people go through, the types of betrayal that they feel, the, the anxiety that they have over their families, and, and then the the one thing, though, that gave me the most encouragement was everyone's sense of liberty, the freedom that they have. And that freedom has, has taken many of us in, in different directions. Some of us have found other relationships with God. Others have found peace with uh, the secular world. Others have become more tolerant of, of everyone else around them. Wherever it has taken them, they've gotten there because they've empowered themselves and given themselves the freedom to be able to think and to own themselves. And I just, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that, so. Charles? Yes. This we, don't have have one we don't have one of those fancy stands that goes up and down. Oh. Like hey, Charles, do you have a wireless mic? <laughs> <line? laughs> Would you like me to use the wireless mic? Well, if you Hold it just speak right, right into the... We had it turn up a little. You can just speak right into the mic. Do you like to loud. turn it up like that, or...? No, he, he's speaking. Yeah, you can flip the switch, just turn that off. Let the switch turn on. Is that working? Okay. Do we get feedback from this one too? Or? Not too bad. Is that too much of an echo? We can hear you now. Okay. It's hard to be done. So you can smoke it a little bit. At any rate, we'll leave that there. Since so many of you told about yourselves and your own experiences the other evening. I guess I should start by telling a little bit about mine. I, of course, was a convert to the LDS Church. I was raised outside the real world, where most of you find yourselves now. Uh, as a young man entering the Army, uh, I was exposed to a lot of uncertainty. This was 1969, as you can imagine. Most of us had no idea where we would be a few months from then. And one of the things that uh, that I found was this fantastic young man that uh, was in the bunk above me that didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't carouse, and he just a, seemed to have his head all together. Turned out he'd been a Mormon for a year and he was just on fire and he could hardly wait to make more Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the gateway, but... <laughs> So I, I began attending church services with him, and I was given the Book of Mormon, told to read it, so I read it, and boy, the next thing you know, I, I was being baptized, and I was becoming Mormon, and my parents thought, what on earth have you done that for? <laughs> but I, I became a Mormon and a good Mormon. I, I committed myself to it, I believed it. And uh, it seems like every two or three months, I learned something else that I hadn't known to begin with, things like the big belief that God had been a man once, and, you know, I won't even touch polygamy or any of that other stuff. But, but since I'd already made my commitment, I'd already been baptized, I just accepted whatever else they, they fed me as it went, and then I grew as a Mormon. Okay, fast forward uh, a few years, moved to Utah, met my wife, married in the temple, raising a family, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I left BYU to, to work and raise my family, and then... Uh, a few years later, I uh, went back to, to finish up a, a degree. I would take, 
I would take history classes and anthropology classes, and I would. Uh, I was fascinated by paleoanthropology and, and archaeology. I would study Mesoamerican uh, culture and uh, uh, the Aztecs, the Olmecs, the Mayans, and, and their architecture. And, and then I would go over to the Joseph Smith building and take a religion class, and then I'd see those same buildings that I knew were 14th century Aztec buildings, you know, being displayed all over the Joseph Smith building to give people a testimony about the Book of Mormon. I thought that was a little bit weird. But, uh, well, over a series of uh, experiences, I, I began to find that my relationship with the LDS Church was not really what I wanted it to be. I found myself depending so much upon my priesthood and my ordinances and everything else that my own relationship with God as a Mormon was suffering. I was having more of a relationship with, with the, the priesthood and with the organization than I was with, uh, with my creator. Well, of course, as a, as a young convert, I, I wanted to be an apologist. And so every time I'd come across a controversy, I'd read everything that everyone had written about it. Hugh Newton was one of my favorites. John A. Witso was one of my favorites. All of you know, the net makers and what have all of these things, and, and every time that I that I found some problem, they would always go and help me rationalize it. And most of you have had that same type of experience. As, as a convert, you're, you're taught that the Mormon Church is this this huge, wonderful, shining, pure, perfect pillar of truth, rising up out of the sea of confusion around it. Right? Something here. Well, the problems I would encounter, things like the yeah, God doctrine and things like problems with the Book of Mormon, all they'd be like a brick or a block that had come disjointed from that pillar of truth and got shot clear off into orbit somewhere. But the apologists would always help me build a bridge of rationalization back to that pillar of truth so that it could at least be connected. And as long as I could connect each little discordant block to that pillar of truth, I was fine for years and years until finally, and I'm really not sure what provoked it, but finally, I stepped back a little bit, and I looked at that pillar of truth with all of those bridges of rationalization connecting all of those loose blocks all over the place, and it looked like a Rube Goldberg structure. <laughs> it was not this perfect pillar of truth that I had once envisioned it as being, but I'd been taught that it had to be. So at that point, I did something that almost all of the rest of you have done. I gave myself the right to ask questions. And until I had done that, I couldn't claim that right. Once I began asking questions, then so many things began to confuse me. And this was back in the early days, folks. This was the late 70s, and there was no organization. There were no support groups. I had no idea that anyone else had ever questioned the church from inside before. 